Larry Yacht, welcome back to the Talent Development Hot Seat. That's good to be back, for sure. Yeah, you, interesting. I was just looking at my notes. I've conducted, at this point, 105 interviews now for this podcast, and I think you are my first returning guest. So Look at that. Welcome back. Yeah, that says something. Either you ran out of guests or uh, I did well the first time. <laughs> well, uh, I haven't run out of guests, that is for sure. I have yes. uh, tons of people lined up, which is just really cool. I have a wealth of connections. Exactly. Now, more growing every day. Uh, but we did have a great conversation last time. I had a lot of great feedback from the interview you did, and I hope people will go back and listen to that about um, you know, really planning, um, setting a desired end state and you know, the, the steps towards that. Um, and today we're going to talk about something related because uh, you and I had a conversation and, uh, you know, I, people listening may not be that familiar with your background, but, uh, you know, retired Navy SEAL officer and I spent many years running missions in the Navy SEALs. And then after you retired, you got into doing corporate work and you were saying to me uh, recently that, you know, how people lead and manage in the corporate world is completely different from how it's done in the military and particularly um, in the SEALs. And I thought it would be really interesting to share some of those lessons today so people listening have that perspective as they think about leadership in the companies they work for. Definitely. And it, it's, it's less, well, on the experiential level, it is about the actions, like you said, the, the way that they lead or manage. But ultimately, the real power is in the change in the paradigm of how they see leading and managing. That's really mm -hmm. where that big shift occurs, right? It's so almost like starts with the perspective, yeah. right? Of how they even perceive what leadership exactly. is. Exactly. Yeah. And, and let's start with that. What are the, what are yeah, the no problem there? Well, ultimately the, the place I always like to start here is to, I could tell you my perspective, but most people, especially if you've, and this is what I love saying is if you have had success in leading, right? If you, not, subjectively but objectively right say you're managing a team of a hundred and you meet your objectives most of the time you know you you could say i i'm good at this and what i love to do is people that are good at it and i've done this in front of large audiences and generally i operate on on the ceo level right so working at that level so you have guys that are running 30 40 million dollar year companies 100 million dollar year companies billion dollar companies and just by the fact that they're running a successful company at those levels, the world saying you, you're figuring out this leadership thing, right? You've got it. Okay. And what I love doing with those people is saying is everything you think you know about leading and managing is backwards. And as soon as I do that, most people cross their arms. They're like, bull, right? Look, I'm doing this. Well, that's not true. And so yeah. I could say, well, this is my distinction and you're not going to listen because right now the people that are listening are saying, no, I, I got this. Well, maybe I'll, I'll pay attention to what he has to say. So I usually like to, to prove it by asking a series of questions at the beginning. And then at the end, after we kind of reveal these distinctions, we ask the same questions and most people, and when I say most, I'd say 99% of the time that I talk through this, they then agree with me at the end. So mm. uh, I'll, I'll start there as opposed to just jumping in and telling you what I think. Okay, let's let's do that. I like that it's ninety nine percent. Every now and then, you do encounter a stubborn person who just refuses to con concede or see your side. Yeah, and with that, uh, they always quit before me. So it, it does end up being a hundred percent. It just sometimes is difficult. It takes a little more time. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Let's start with the questions. Yeah. So the first one is okay. You've got unfortunately you meet an untimely demise next week, right? Get mm -hmm. hit by a bus, whatever it is. And they're burying you and your family has a choice between two headstones. On one headstone, it says, uh, Andy, you know, beloved father and husband, uh, the greatest leader ever. Or the alternative one is the greatest manager ever. Which, and for all of you listening, think the same thing. Which headstone do you choose? Which do I prefer or which do I think I'm qualified for? Which do you prefer? You get a choice. Uh, the former, of course. Yeah, the best leader ever, right? right. Yeah. So every, everyone says that almost yeah. exclusively. Everyone says that. And my argument is that by the end of this, uh, when, when I ask that same question, you're going to change your answer. Hmm. Okay. And so within that, I'll ask you, when you think of manager, what do you think of? Uh, someone who has, uh, you know, people reporting to them uh, with tasks they need to do. And they're sort of overseeing that and making sure everybody does the the things that they need to do and they they're connecting 
you know, company or organizational goals down to the tasks that people are doing yep. and making sure that they're aiming towards a specific target and, and you know, working towards a, a common good. Yeah, and arguably a necessary evil within an organization. Right, yeah. Like totally. you would I mean, kind they're, of They're want... providing accountability, right? Yeah. The, how, when you think a leader, what do you think of? Same thing, uh, same answer. I mean, in the corporate world, they, they often tend to be one and the same, but I think anybody can be a leader. Certainly you can lead your peers, you can lead people around you, you can lead your friends, right? It's like, um, you know, it could be inspiring, motivating, um, setting an example for people to improve, get better. Uh, and so I think people tend to want to inspire more towards being a leader versus being a manager. For those reasons. Why? Because it's not as, in my mind, it's not as tactical. And it's something that is more admirable, at least in our, our culture. Yeah. And so that's the common, that's the very common understanding, right? The, the common understanding is that managers are these kind of mid-level drones that are necessary mm -hmm. to kind of get things running. Yep. And a leader is this inspiring figure, usually at the front, you know, follow me, we're going to do this, right? Like that's, right. that's a common understanding. Yeah. Like, you know, famous George Washington wasn't a manager, right? George Washington was a leader. <laughs> that's, that's what you think. And I'm going right. to prove, prove opposite, right? Okay. I'm going to prove that in reality, it's the opposite. Mm -hmm. And in, especially in high functioning organizations, it's yeah. the opposite. And a lot of this depends on the distinctions that we use around them and our understanding of it. And what, what I'm also going to prove is that your language, our language around leadership, managing and following is all screwy. That what, when you say leader, you really mean manager. When you say manager, you really mean leader. That when we talk about followers that are really good, we actually mean leaders. Like it, it's really interesting how when we start tying these titles or these words to behaviors, all of a sudden it gets all screwy. And so within this, we'll do one more little experiment. And I, I'll ask the people at home to do the same thing, right? So do the same thing, super easy. You can just do it in your head. I want you to think of the best leader you've ever worked with or for. So think of their name. And I want you to come up with two things. So the name and then one specific action that they did that had you assess them as the best manager you've ever, or the best leader you've ever been with. So an action, something specific that they did, mm -hmm. and then one word to describe how they made you feel. So take a minute, write this down, because I'm gonna we're, I'm gonna check back with you in a couple seconds here. Okay, I've got it. Yep. So name some sort of action that had you attribute them as being a great leader, and the more specific the action, the better. And then the last thing is one word as to how they made you feel. All right. So um, the leader that I am thinking of is you don't uh, have to tell me yet because oh, okay. I want. I bet I could tell you what's on your paper without even knowing. Really? Yeah. Okay. Um, so write them down and I'll, I'll show you what I mean. All right. And um, what was it? The, uh, the, the action and how they made me feel, right? Yeah. One word, one word, they made, how, how they made you feel. Um, you could do two words if you need to, but generally one is good enough. And don't tell me, because like I said, it's a magic trick I want to show you. Okay. Okay, you got it. Yep. Okay, so before I'll get back to that here in a second. Before we get into that, uh, the question I want to bring up to you next is: uh, Let's talk. Look at a, a famous leader in history, right? And the one I use all the time is Patton, General okay. Patton, okay. right? So especially with the Third Army in World War II. So that was the the Third Army had was all the tanks, right? And that's what he he used. Uh, going across the country did amazing things. So within that, uh, how many tanks did Patton drive? Uh, well, I bet I want to say it in position. He probably didn't drive any, but I, there yeah. are some famous yeah. photos of him driving or in a, a tank. I feel Sitting like. in one, right? In the yeah, top, right? He didn't drive any. He didn't drive, he didn't drive any. Right. How many, how many rounds did he fire at enemy tanks? Uh, well, probably none during World War II. Maybe none, one. right? Yeah, never. How many times, how about this, that he was in a battle and like was on the radio and told the, like these three tanks go over there and this tank go over there? I wouldn't expect him to even be doing that. No. Right? He's setting the high level strategy. Yeah, so none, yeah. right? But we'd say like many people would say Patton's an unbelievable leader, Yeah. right? But he didn't actually take any actions 
any what would be considered leadership actions on the mm. battlefield, correct? Yeah. What right. was his job, his primary job? Uh, he was setting the overall strategy for the army in the, the Mediterranean theater in World War II. Like, yeah, so where they wanted to go. One, very clear direction, right? Mm -hmm. So providing very clear direction, not on specific tactics or even specific strategies, like these six tanks are going to go here and these six mm -hmm. tanks are going to over there. It was really what, what future he wanted his tanks to create so yeah. we need to be able to t be able to produce an environment where we control this amount of land or we take this city mm. or that city or we cut yeah. off the supply line here there or the other thing so that's really clarity in what the future looks like he didn't get into how to get it done right his job was to to produce that one clarity in in what the future looked like yeah. and then he relied on his his leaders right i would mm -hmm. i'll use the word leaders to come up with the specific strategies and execute the specific tactics necessary to produce that future right so that's one okay. what else was he responsible for doing uh i mean he was he was overseeing a certain number of leaders right who he was responsible for probably deciding who was in command positions within the the, the theater right um and reporting things back to uh his. You're right. His his commanding officer and the president, I'm sure, and as well as who's leading all the efforts. I don't know. What else? Yeah. So within that, another thing would you'd be able to say is to create, enable, and support his leaders. Mm -hmm. Right. So his job was to create leaders that could come up with strategies to fulfill the future he's promising, as well as to execute the specific tactics to get it done. Mm -hmm. Right. So one, create. So create what how do you do that? Through training right through through creating environments for them to get the education they needed for selection enabling and supporting right to be able to find those that are doing really well make sure that they're in the they're in the appropriate positions make mm -hmm. sure that they have all the resources they need that's the other huge piece right yeah. to make sure that they had the tanks the gasoline the bullets the band-aids all they need to get yeah. the job done right. so create enable and support is okay. to me the next big piece yeah and then the last piece is one I've never got, to, no one's ever said, but the next piece, the last piece is, so if his job is not to be on the battlefield, so his job is to direct the, the action that's necessary up front, mm -hmm. and his job is to make sure that he's, he's enabled, created, enabled, and supported leaders to go do that, and then he sends those leaders out to do that. The last piece is a really important piece is being in a safety net in case things go wrong. So his job is to think ahead yep. when his leaders are out fighting to make sure that if they get off track, that they don't hurt themselves or, some, or someone else, right? To be able to be that safety net yeah. so that they're able to be out there. Because think of it even just as, as a selfish manner. If I'm that general and I'm responsible for the battlefield and I'd never be able to sleep if I didn't put in safety nets to make sure that if something goes wrong, my leaders are taken care of. Yeah, contingency plans to know what you were going to do when things blew contingency, up. Contingency, right? support, yep. you know, thinking three, four steps ahead, right? So his job was not to take action. His job was not even to really evoke action on the battlefield. His job was to be able to enable and support action on the battlefield. So the big thing there is support, right? It is a very much a supporting role, not an action role. Right? And I would argue that's management, right? The job of a manager is not to take action and evoke action. The job of a manager is to create leaders that can take action and evoke action, right? A manager's job is creation of leaders and creating an environment where those leaders can be effective. So now, the job of the manager is to actually create the leaders that take and evoke action from the people. Exactly. Okay. Now, within that, what makes you a manager is a title, positional authority, right? By the th fact that he was general, he has to manage, right? And he can't lead. Say he was in there in the tanks telling the guy where to shoot the round. What kind of manager do we call that? Micromanager. Do we like those? No. Is I that don't. a good leader? No. 
No one I mean, does. In some places, yes, but most of the time, no. People don't want to work for micromanagers. Yeah, and, and ultimately, the only time micromanagers are necessary are in extremely low-functioning teams, right? When you have dysfunctional people in a, in a low-functioning team, then yes, you need to micromanage, right? You need to control their actions. But no one likes that. No one wants to be that, right? And the more that you're leading, the more that you're in there directing action, the more that you're micromanaging, people don't like that kind of manager. Right. So if you have positional authority, and positional authority comes in any, any way, shape, or form, it could be father, husband, you know, division manager, CEO. As soon as you have that title, you have a responsibility to manage at some point. And ultimately, the managers that lead a lot, right, that are in the action, are micromanagers. We don't like them. Right. And that's where most people go wrong. Right. Most managers go wrong because they want to be that leader that's in the fight, like follow me, take the hill. Right. That's what you're talking about. George Washington on front of that ship. Mm -hmm. You know, that same picture we see, like you got the rowboat yep. and there's yep. George with his Boston foot up. Yep. That's bullshit. Right? <laughs> like absolute bullshit. That never right. happened. Right. He would have been the last guy across, not the first guy across. Right. Think of how stupid that would be. Right. <laughs> that I'm going to send the general standing up on the front of the rowboat. Right into enemy territory first like absolutely ludicrous right right but that's what we think and that's yeah. what most leaders right oh, i'm gonna lead like i'm the one with my my foot up in the captain morgan's position on the front of the rowboat in the middle of the action in the middle of the project which does, has limited work hmm. right and the reason that's so important from the seal community is i'm the one that has the least experience generally on the team as an officer yeah right because as soon as i have a lot of experience i'm i'm in charge of four or five units right like i'm not in charge of the unit that goes out and fights the the officers that are in charge of units that go out and fight have little to no experience so imagine getting into as an officer getting into a unit where everyone that is in that unit knows that they're smarter than you knows they're stronger than you the Navy spent millions of dollars to condition them to know that they can do anything there that is humanly possible. And they objectively have 10 times your experience. Imagine if I went into that unit and said, you do this and you do that and do it this way. I mean, it, it wouldn't work. My job was to create the environment for those. Those are leaders, right? They're the leaders. They've got the, the physical skill, the knowledge, the experience. It's their job to lead me. It's my job to create the environment where they can lead. Hmm. Now that sounds really simple, but it's a, very, it's a very deep statement, right? You know, those leaders, their leaders, my job is to manage leaders, to enable, create, and support those leaders, to create, and to create an environment where they can lead, right? That's my job as a manager. It's not to take action and tell them what actions to take. Now, that distinction is important, one, because they have more experience than me, and two, the environment that I'm in is so dynamic that if you rely on one person to tell everyone what to do, we're all going to die. Yeah. And so we had to create an environment where my job was to ensure that leaders were not only created at, at every level in organization, but they were supported and enabled to lead, right? They had all the resources they need, all the direction, all the clarity on where they're going, as well as they were given the authority to lead. My job was to manage and follow. Mm. I have now, a question. You, yeah. you, were, you, you said multiple times that the, the, the people in the field, they have more experience than you as an officer. You even said 10 times more experience. Why is that the case? Haven't you come up through the ranks to become an officer and you've done, haven't you done the job that they have done? No, there, no there's, two different, there's two different tracks, right? Oh, enlisted okay. and officer tracks are different. And mm -hmm. some, some enlisted guys will turn into an officer, but it's very rare. Uh, not so, it's not so much very rare. I mean, what I'd say 10, 15% of officers are what we call Mustangs, meaning they were enlisted first, hmm. but just age wise for that to happen, they've only done one or two deployments. So maybe they've been enlisted for two or three years, 
and then they decide to go officer. So yeah, they have more experience than I did coming straight from, from, I went from the Naval Academy straight into Bud, straight into an officer position. So they might have a couple years on me, but it's not like they have 15 years of experience as an enlisted guy. Then they go the officer route because they'd be too old. Yeah. So, and the enlisted guys will have done three, four deployments. I mean, they, they'll have done this two year cycle. You know, they've got six, seven, 10, 15 years right. in when I've got two. So, so the idea here is not to say for you as the officer to come in and say, Hey, I know how you should be doing this because I've done this before. And, you know, therefore you often become a micromanager is to say, you know how to do this job better than me. Tell me what to do. Let me, you know, here's our direction. Tell me how, how you think it should go yeah. and let me help set the overall strategy. And, and I could see a and similarity keep and keep you safe. Right. And I could see a similarity in the corporate world where you have, you know, people getting MBAs and, and degrees that, that set them up into executive positions fairly quickly compared to maybe blue collar workers who are on the front lines who are never going to rise to that, you know, office level. And yet the, the people who are 10 levels above them don't really have the, the frontline experience of doing the job that those people on the front line do. And I, I don't know, I've, do, I've worked with a ton of organizations and in those organizations, generally those people in those positions are not, you know, spend a lot of time in the more direction right. and less of the enable and support. And that's why the organizations don't operate as smoothly or as effectively as we do. And, mm -hmm. and I've, I've been in enough organizations at all levels from, you know, a couple million dollars a year up to 1.2 billion a year. So, I mean, I'm talking, I've had experience in a lot of ranges yeah. of organizations and very rarely, I've actually, I've never seen it where managers are managing versus doing leading. Right. Cause because of the same perspective that you had when we ask and everyone else is like, yeah, I want to be a leader, right? I want to be George Washu with my foot up on the bow. That's what I want to do. As opposed, I've never had someone say, yes, my whole purpose in life is to manage really well. That's because the understanding of the true understanding of how it works for manage and lead is different right now. And you, I can, you can also start by asking like, well, okay, what's your definition for leadership and management? And people yeah. fumble around with definitions. I mean, they don't really have one. What's right. the difference? Well, you know, one does direction and the other does. I mean, I've heard all sorts of stuff, but it's not very clear or functional. And for right. me, the, the big distinctions are the role of a manager is to create an, create an environment that supports leaders in making the right choices. And the key words there are create an environment support and leader and the the definition or distinction for leading is to create an environment that enables followers in making the right choice and the big difference is support versus enable right so support is i do stuff ahead of time and then you go out and through the supporting role make good choices as a leader enable is in the moment Right. My job is to enable your your choices as we're taking action. And so being so, able to go I, ahead. I just want to clarify, I'm, I'm thinking now about going back to the military, military and I'm thinking about, you know, the ultimate um, boss or leader or manager is the president. Right. And yep. so the you know, the president of the United States is often referred to as the leader of the free world. So you're arguing Commander that. Commander in chief. Yeah, the commander in chief. He's that, the manager of the free right, world. Right. He's actually the man the manager of the free world. Doesn't Which is ultimately like true, right? right? How much actual leading does he do? Hardly any, because he doesn't yeah. know squat. Like and it just, it, think of just as a commander in chief, right? The lead military. He doesn't know most presidents know squat about military well, tactics. Our last four presidents, US presidents, have no military experience, right? Before they always right. did. So they don't even have any actual military experience. So how, if they can't lead the military, what they can do is manage it well and be led by the highly experienced military leaders, right? right? So that's where Patton's job was to manage down and to lead up, right? So to lead his manager, you know, he, the C, what senior generals and or the, the commander in chief, right? Well, the president. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was the president of the United States at the time. Right. So to provide, provide uh, the president with the information they need, that the president needs to manage Patton well, right? Mm -hmm. And so 
my job is as a manager, my job was to manage and follow my leaders that I create, enable, and support. Hmm. Right. And if you think about that from that perspective, would you rather be someone that has spent your entire time in the trenches, right? Leading and following and switching back and forth, or would you like to look back and say, holy crap, my life was spent creating, enabling, and supporting leaders across all levels, right? Yeah. I want to manage all day long, right? Yeah. My job, right. yeah, my job is to be able to, and that's why I love what I do now, right? My whole job is just enabling mm. kick-ass managers, which in turn create kick-ass leaders, right? So if you look at a progression, and this is an interesting progression to look at, and this is the only progression that works. And if you don't go through this progression, it's going to fall apart. Until you have good individual performance, and I don't mean good, excellent, right? Until you can perform really well at an individual level, you'll never be included on a high functioning team, right? And people get this backwards all the time. Well, if I can just get on the right team, then I, my, I'll do better. Well, you can't. You have to first do well yourself. Yeah. So you have to have superior individual performance, and then you'll be included onto high-functioning teams. Yeah. Once you get onto the high-functioning team, if you perform as a follower really well, by the nature of making really good choices and taking effective actions, others are going to start following you. Right? And that's an interesting distinction around leading and following. The only difference is who's making a better choice right? Whoever makes the best choice, others are going to see that and start doing the same thing, yeah. right? Which is following. So by being highly effective on a highly functioning team, I will start inspiring or evoking leadership, hmm. right? Or yeah. followership, which makes me leading. So I right. first have to perform well individually. Then yeah. I have to perform well on a team. Then I get to lead on that team. And ultimately, making the jump from leading on a team, taking action and evoking action into managing leaders is a big step. And that's where most people fail. All right, let's, let's make this um, practical for our listeners who are especially yeah. working in talent development, who are, um, their primary purpose is to develop people in an organization, create better leaders or better managers who are more effective. Um, how can we take action with this? What can they do to create better managers who are thinking more like a, a military manager? Well, the first thing is changing the paradigm around leading and managing, right? Getting to the point where people aspire to manage and not be in, in action. So I N space action, right? A leader's job is to be in action, highly effective action, and to inspire and evoke highly effective action. Right? And if we just look at it fundamentally, that's what a leader does. A leader makes good choices and inspires or evokes good choices in others, which is leadership. Right? So that's where most people like being. They like to be in action and they like to be evoking action in someone else. As a manager, your job is to not do that. And that's the hard spot. Now, if I'm a manager, I'm the CEO and I'm in my head of marketing's thing taking a back action with him or her and evoking their action, I'm micromanaging. Like that's not my job. My job is to stay out of that. My job is to create to one, make sure they have clarity on what to do, that they have the resources to do it, the authority to do it, that they're empowered to do it and to make sure that if they screw up, it doesn't hurt them or someone else. Right. So going back to those three key actions of a manager is one clarity on what the future looks like two, create, enable and support leaders and three safety net in case of failure. So taking this practical. So if you want to inspire highly effective management, which to me is the step above leadership, right? First, you got to stay out of action, like in the trenches action. That's the first thing. And then how do we do that? Well, you stay in these three core things, making sure everyone's clear on where you're going, making sure that you're creating, enabling, and supporting leaders. You know, you're building and evoking leadership at all levels. And three, safety net in case of failure. Now, here's the magic trick. So look at your, your card. Okay. 
what is the action that you wrote down? Um, the thing that made uh, this person, uh, I thought, a, I think a really effective leader is uh, what I wrote down is she is very empathetic and uh, that she uh, identifies and understands people's strengths very well. Okay. So, but that, so that's a description of a way yeah. of being for her, but what did she do? So what action was that? So, and that led to what? Uh, what her action? being able to put people in the right places to, to uh, leverage their strengths and also to hold people accountable and, you know, be able to connect and relate to people to motivate them, inspire them to do their jobs better. Yeah. So what she did, and I'm, tell me, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but tell me if, you know, if I'm summarizing this well, what she did was create an environment where you were able to be highly effective. Yeah. In doing so, did that drive others to see you as a leader by you being highly effective? Yes, it did. Yes. Okay. So she created and enabled you to lead. Yes. What, how did that make you feel? What was the word you wrote? Uh, it made me feel, uh, well, I, I wrote down uh, yeah. inspired, understood, valued, uh, and Good. I would add empowered as well. Yeah, empowered. I, I could I could have told you one of the words was going to be in there. Empowered, safe, yeah. right? Understood, supported, clear on what to do. Right. So was she a kick-ass leader or kick-ass manager? Uh, I guess she was a kick-ass manager and still is. Magic, right? Yeah. So I yeah. I could with I knew that's what's on there, right? Every time that someone does this, it always falls in one of those three things, right? I was always clear, right? Clarity on what I need mm. to produce. I was always empowered, supported, lead, led, like I, they wouldn't say led, but I knew what to do, right? Yeah. I was, I, I, they made me feel better. I had more skills, right? That create, enable, and support. Or the last one is I always felt they, they had my back. I was safe. If I messed up, they're going to they're gonna cover for me. Safety net in case of failure. So those three those three behaviors or roles that I talked about as a manager, every time we do this, it falls into one of those three. And the emotions are always the same, inspired, heard, uh, empowered, safe, supported. It's always the same things. So inevitably, you just prove that I'm right, right? That when we think of, when we experience what we would say is amazing leadership, we're actually experiencing kick-ass management. How many times did she tell you what to do? Like, go do this specific thing. Oh, never. Not once, right? Not once. Yeah. So she didn't lead you ever. No. She managed you amazingly. Yeah. Which empowered you as a leader. Now, why does this work all the time is, again, if you think of it from the SEAL perspective, if you have one leader, the officer is the one leader and everyone else follows mm -hmm. and I get shot what happens? We are now a leaderless crew. We all die, yeah. right? Now, if my job was to create, enable, and support leaders at every level, yep. I get shot, what happens? Uh, someone else picks up the, the, the staff, whatever even, it is, and people even, know what to do. People know what to do. Yeah. Right? Even better than somebody, yeah. anybody, right. is the actual word. Yeah. People Anyone still know what to do. They know how to do their jobs. They continue on. Because they have clear direction. They've yeah. been created, enabled, and supported the lead. And there's yeah. safety nets in case of failure anyway. So it doesn't yeah. matter. And they feel empowered to make decisions versus just waiting for that one person to yeah. tell them what's And going. your answer is actually absolutely wrong. Everyone would wail and cry for the loss of me. But, you know, after that, <laughs> then they get into effective action. So, uh, so you're I so know. callous. I, I die and no, you don't even care. It's, we Well, I pre presumably we have a mission. We, we yeah. <laughs> I don't know how it works. I'm not, a, obviously I didn't serve in the military, but I don't think you, when you're in the middle of a mission, you stop to. Yeah. Well, I'm, SEALs are known for crying in the middle of missions. It's a little known fact. Yeah, I had no uh, idea. Yeah, we were learning. All, we're learning all kinds of stuff, all sorts of stuff. Yeah, I would what, try, Larry. What's interesting, just to wrap this up, because this is the other paradigm that absolutely changes mine. So we just, hopefully, everyone out there, if you did the experiment, I know, I, I know, I've done this thousands of times, and always works out the same way. And think of how screwy our language is, right? Yeah. Who's the best leader you've ever worked with? 
oh, it's actually the best manager and you proved it, I didn't, right? That's why I do it this way. Like you wrote this down without me doing it. I just said, I know what's, I know what's on that paper. Yeah. Because fundamentally, if the person was a very effective, let's say, quote unquote, leader in your mind, they're actually managing well. Hmm. Now, on the same respect, if you had one of your, you, you have a, a group of people that you lead. So you're the leader. So you got these followers. And let's actually say manager. So we act, we use our words correctly, right? So you manage 10 people. And of those 10 people, one person's always in effective action right? They always know what to do. They always have the skill to do it. it. That you always know what they're up to. If they need help, they come to you right away, right? That's the t that type of person. You would call them a leader in your group. So when someone follows really, really well, and they're in very effective action, we would call them a leader. Think of how screwy our language is. Who's the best leader you've ever worked for? It's actually the best manager. Who's your best follower? Oh, it's actually a leader. Hmm. Right? So no wonder we have problems yeah. within organizations. Well, and nobody wants to be a follower or be called a follower, right? You'd rather be a leader, even though followers or people who uh, you know, take are the action, they're, yeah. they're just as important, if not more important than the They man. are the most important. Right. <laughs> they do right. the thing. Yeah. And so that's why you know, yeah. I've always, as you know, right, we got a long enough history that I love being different, right? You to call yeah. me normal is the worst insult. I'm abnormal, right? I want to yeah. be the best manager ever. And I want to be the best follower ever. Cause that means that I've done nothing but create leaders in my life. Yeah. Cause if I've done that, right. If I manage really well, I've created nothing but amazing leaders, which means all I have to do is follow my amazing leaders to success. Mm -hmm. So put on my headstone, the best managers last follower ever. Wow. I will, uh, I'll take it. I'll have to remember that if I ever get yeah. that uh, responsibility. Uh, interesting. So you've completely shifted uh, our, our paradigm here and our thoughts on leadership and management. Yeah. Um, and I know we have to, to wrap things up here. Um, you know, for people listening, working in large organizations, you worked yeah. with large, large organizations in the past. We talked about shifting the paradigm being the, the, the important thing. Um, what's one more piece of advice you would give you think about, going to executives and vice presidents and saying, hey, I want you to think of yourself more as a manager. Think more in terms of high level strategy and you know, empowering your people, being, you know, setting the direction, clarity, making it safe for them. Uh, what's one more thing that they or we could be doing to set them up for success? So, I mean, the short answer to that is you have to be an extremely good follower which we just identified is actually a good leader, right? If we're using the good word, the good terminology. And, and for me, the, when it comes to managing, your job is to create, enable, and support leaders. And your job as a, a lead follower, and I use the word lead follower because our job as a leader is to lead and follow depending on the situation. The primary thing there is to take effective action and evoke effective action, right? So when I use that understanding, when I am in highly effective action, I will naturally evoke action in others that, that mirrors mine, right? Follows, that's what following is at the best level. And I can do that, I need to do that as much up as I need to do it down, right? So my job as a leader within an organization is to lead my managers because they don't know right? If they knew, they wouldn't be the manager, they'd be a leader, right? They'd be in with us. So my job is to very clearly evoke effective choices in my manager as much as it is to evoke effective choices in those that are following me. And how do I do that? Well, it gets a little more complicated, right? There's actions that are associated with that. And how can we do that? Well, make sure that I'm, they're always giving me the information I need, a clarity on where I'm going. Uh, my job's always to make sure that I have all the, the knowledge, skills, and resources I need, right? So always consolidating more information. So when a manager comes in with a need, I've got the resource. The biggest one is over-report information. Like I want my managers to know more about what I'm doing than I do because only then can they make good choices. And so I, my process, when I'm, when I'm leading my manager, I want them to tell me, Larry, stop telling me what you're doing. It's way too much information. 
Hmm. And ultimately it's selfish because I can't be wrong if you, you as my manager right. know exactly what I'm doing. Right. Right. So over report, which is where most people go the wrong direction, right? They under report. And the biggest, most important one by far, and this is what we could leave on, but this one is the biggest one. The most powerful tool of a leader is to sincerely ask for help. Hmm. And there, we could do a whole nother episode around what it means and the power of asking for help and how asking for help sincerely to someone with capability and capacity is yeah. one of the most connecting and one of the strongest leadership tools you have. I mean, there's mm. a whole, there's a whole discussion around that. Yeah. So yeah that's we could the do biggest a, one. We could do a whole another discussion around people, the importance of asking for help, why people don't ask for help, yep. uh, why they should be. Uh, but we will end on that. Uh, but speaking of asking for help, for anybody listening who wants help yes, with this, I and love it. Connect with you and learn. Um, I practice my transitions all day long. Good what, job. Uh, where where should people go to reach out and connect with you? Amazing leader, Andy. Uh, it's just that, Thank you. That's Thank you. And follower. Leading, leading the right way. I love I it. Following your lead. Got it. So uh, within that, and this ties into the question you asked. So, okay, we just I just changed your paradigm on this. One of the risks, and they risk to anyone listening, you now have a different way to view the world. What we just did was make a bigger gap. Like if you were having management or leadership problems before, and now you have this, it just got worse. And that's where just out of responsibility, I need to tell you, right? This is the tip of the iceberg. That shift in paradigm needs to be communicated to those that you work with, because if you start acting in this way without proper communication, to those that you're managed by or leading, you're just gonna create more dysfunction. And so within that, being able to have the right narratives and understanding of how to communicate this is really important. That's how you can create significant change within an organization. And ultimately that's what we do, right? Our business is doing that, is being able to empower managers to have the knowledge, skills, and resources to increase the leadership of their organization. And how do you know if, if you need that? If you've ever sat there saying, I, I need more support, right? Like I need more support. I can't, my team, I can't get my team to do what I need it to do. You know, sometimes they fulfill, but most of the time it just seems like they're coming up short. That's the world telling you that you are not managing well, which I hate to say it, but it's true, right? Ultimately it's, it, since you have the positional authority, if your team isn't supporting you in the way that you need, because you have an inspired the leadership that is necessary. Mm -hmm. So th that's what we do. We, pr we specialize in education around taking these things into organizations, uh, generally at the, the manager level and all the way up to the very senior level. And so uh, they could find us, I think I'm putting together something special for you, for you from what Ann said around some classes. Uh, so some, a series of free classes that talk through what I just did Cool. Uh, just on a deeper level and you should be able to find that at our website. So it's plan P L A N dash site S I G H T dot com forward slash leaders. And within that, what it, I, I'm putting together a series of four uh, free classes that's going to cover what we talked about in a little bit deeper, deeper detail. And within that, feel free to use this. So it's free. So uh, feel free to use it within the organizations. You can show the videos at, at, uh, with your team, which is going to be one of the best things to do. Uh, no selling in it, just straight, straight content. Straight content of value, which I know you're all about. I've yes. been through your courses in the past, Larry, and got a ton of value from it, uh, which is how we built this relationship and why you're on now. And so it's plan dash site uh, slash leaders. We'll put a link to that in the show notes uh, so people can access that. Uh, Larry, this has been awesome. You have shifted my paradigm. Do you want to, do you want to manage your headstone too exactly. now? Exactly. I want on, yes. on leadership and management. I now want to manage your headstone. You I blow love it. Mind. I have so many more questions, but we have to wrap things up. But luckily, you and I are hanging out this weekend, I think. So oh, I'll yeah. Questions then. Uh, thanks so much for coming on and, and sharing uh, your wisdom and advice here. Uh, really appreciate it, Larry. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right. Take care. Thank mm -hmm. you.